All right. We are live. <laughs> We're live. <laughs> Awesome. So, so nice to be here. I'm, I'm so happy that uh, this event came together. I mean, we have been talking for quite a long time <laughs> about organizing this. So it's sure nice have. that it's finally happening. Yeah, we're um, really excited yeah. to, to have uh, this opportunity as well. We, um, we've been, uh, we have a lot of our own tech crew watching today because they know that a lot of our tech people um, are really into this meetup group as well. So I think um, a lot of us are really stoked about it. Yeah, nice. And I, we should say that, uh, yeah, welcome to everyone who is uh, who is here already. Our idea is that we, we're going to wait until uh, 10 past 6 before we start with the presentation. So before that, uh, we are just going to sit here and talk <laughs> for, for a few minutes. And uh, well, I'm and uh, for you who haven't uh, uh, seen me before, I'm, my name is Johnny Stromberg, and I'm one of the organizers of Stockholm uh, JS. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Uh, Jasmina. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm Jasmina Menikuch. I'm the marketing manager at Futurist Stockholm. Um, I guess I will tell uh, you all a little bit more about who we are in a little bit when we when we get started. But um, yeah, super stoked to be here. Mm -hmm. Nice. Have you had any other meetups uh, during this uh, special time that we're in? <laughs> yeah, we had, um, let me think, we had one uh, online meetup with uh, Pink Programming back in <clears throat> the springtime when it all started. Um, and that's been it. Then we've had some events with students, with universities, with KTH, um, all online as well. And uh, we have some more coming up. It's, um, <clears throat> It's really interesting. I mean, we host our own webinars. Um, so we've been doing that quite a lot through this tool. It's been very, very fun. Um, but it's uh, it's really interesting. I mean, we are a company who, who like to have events and meet people uh, physically, you know, say hi and have a drink, a beer, just like most meetup groups. So it's uh, it's been a, a challenge and a change, but I think uh, it's been a good change too. Mm. Yeah, nice just... that you have had some. Meet yeah, it's nice that you have had some meetups. Uh, anyways, I mean, we had had like uh, two two meetups this spring for for Stockholm JS, and then like, <clears throat> I mean, for me, I, uh, I mean, w one of the main things that I do that when I'm not organizing Stockholm JS is that I also organize the Nordic JS conference, which and uh, <laughs> so 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 for us. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Corona was uh, quite a big, uh, big thing, so to speak. But, but in the end, yeah. we 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 just realized that we had to just um, postpone the event for for a year, which feels yeah. uh, pretty weird since we have been doing it for like I don't know six or this would have been the seventh year or something. So it's uh, yeah. it's quite a big change for me to not have have that event now. Uh, but yeah, but yeah, but it is. But it could also be good with your break, I guess, because we work so much with it. So it's kind of like we, we usually have it in October. And, and uh, I yeah. talked to my colleagues about it. And it was like, do, do you remember that we, I mean, we usually are supposed to have like Nordic JS now. And now <laughs> we're just like sitting at the and, you know, that was quite a big uh, difference from from uh, what we usually do at, the, at that time. Yeah. So. so I'm sure. I'm sure. It's uh, yeah. I mean, a lot of conferences who've decided to cancel, and uh, some who've tried to go online as well. <laughs> we are joining one bigger event that was supposed to be face to face uh, in a few weeks, and it will be really interesting to see how they how they go about those events as well that are supposed to be, you know, more conference style. So yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, but we look forward to joining Nordic JS next year as well. Um, I know that we uh, attend every year as well. As participants, so we look forward to October next year. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully back somewhat. Uh, by then. Yeah, I hope so too, and that would that would be awesome if you if you join there as well. Yeah, uh, and um, yeah, I mean it's it's uh, it will be quite interesting. We were thinking about like different versions of like can we have an online event or or things like that, mm -hmm. but. But I think in the end, I mean, it's such an important part of our, I don't know, 
the thing we do, our brand and everything, like the experience overall. Uh, I think it's so important uh, the f like uh, the physical part of it, or like the actual on-site experience. Yeah. Uh, so right. it's yeah, we 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 realized that it we we couldn't really do it on as an online event and that in that particular in that particular event. But I think that it's interesting to see how many events that have gone um, gone online in the like past half year. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's been really interesting. I think uh, we had some student events this uh, a week ago or so, and you know, just trying to reach everyone that you usually are able to talk to face to face. It's uh, it's a struggle, but I, I, um, I'm impressed by all the companies who've dedicated so much time to going online and uh, you know, just change their whole all the planning around it. I mean, it's, it's a big change and um, it's really cool to see that, you know, we can, it doesn't matter if there's a pandemic, if the world changes, we will adapt. Um, and I think that's been a really cool thing to see around the world uh, these past few months. How has the, like the, how has the everyday life at futures changed? Like, how are you handling the, the pandemic? Yeah. I mean, we're we're lucky, right? Because we're a, we're a digital innovation company, so we're we're relatively good at this stuff. Um, but of course, there's a change. We don't meet up at the coffee maker anymore and, and have a small chat. But um, so we in March when it started, um, we all went remote. Um, and then when things started get be getting better again, we were able to go to the office once in a while. Um, we had this long time sign up sheet and there was only like 10 of us allowed to be there at once. So you still didn't get that feeling, you know, and, uh, now that things have gotten worse again, uh, we closed down again. So we're all working from home. Um, but we've been really good at, By the way, know, I'm, having... I'm seeing a, a question here or, or are they saying that there's quite high music in the background? So I wonder if, uh, can we shut yeah. off the music maybe? Yeah, uh, because me... <laughs> yeah, we, we can't hear. We should say that, that me, me and Yasmina, we can't hear the music. So <laughs> let me I'm see what we can do about that. Of course. Um... One second. <clears throat> Even though we also heard that the music was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Um, give me one second. Maybe um, Jens or uh, Juhis wants to come on and talk to you for a second while I just uh -huh. go, go dark. For, okay, but now uh, it turns out it isn't music for everyone. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. so it's maybe maybe just uh, one person that, ha that has music. <laughs> maybe it's, he has it on it his speakers. <laughs> Maybe uh, can we get some more people letting us know? Do you all hear okay. music? Um, <laughs> or, or if anyone hears music, please let us know. <laughs> and, yeah, I got uh, some more confirmation that not everyone hears the music. <laughs> really interesting. <laughs> what music? Uh, so, okay. Um, hmm. Okay, let's just no assume me. for a while that there are no music, and if someone someone hears the music, uh, we will investigate it further. Maybe for, for the person who hears the music, uh, try logging in and out, refreshing the page, uh, and uh, let us know if you have any uh, issues with that. Still, we're getting some this more confirmations here, really... so I feel better now. <laughs> It's good. This is one of those tricks that the that the experienced webcam people know, like people that do do uh, webinars a lot. They want to have like questions and they want to have engagement from the from the yeah. people listening. So they, <laughs> we just say that is there music, and then everyone just start writing. It's super super nice trick. <laughs> exactly. Uh, All right. So that's uh, but... okay. Glad to hear not everyone's hearing it. Should we, um, do you think should we get yeah, started? No, yeah, sure. I think that, um, 
yeah, we let's get started. I mean, people will probably join uh, as we as we talk as well, but but um, yeah, let's assume that most people are here now, and uh, then I would like to officially welcome uh, everyone that mm -hmm. is uh, watching and listening to Stockholm JS sixty seven here at uh, Futurist. We are super happy uh, to be here. And uh, well, my name is Johannes Strumberg, and I'm one of the organizers of Stockholm uh, JS. Uh, and uh, yeah, welcome everyone. And now we will start off with uh, Yasmina telling us a bit about uh, Futurist. And um, yeah, and I should also say that we will have during the two talks uh, during this evening, uh, you can ask uh, questions in a a box here somewhere we have a Q&A and then you can post them during the talks and then um, the, the speakers will answer them uh, after the talk so just keep keep sending them in during the presentations and then we will um, yeah um, they will answer them in the end so um, yeah All right. uh, over to you <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you again for, for having us. We're really happy to be here. And also from, from our side here at Futurist, welcome um, to this meetup tonight. Um, so let me tell you all a little bit about who we are, for those of you who don't know us. So we're an international digital innovation company, um, and we help organizations transform their businesses by... Um, bringing together software engineering um, and beautiful human-centered design. And we like to say that we help our clients become future resilient. So we were founded in Helsinki in 2000. And we actually celebrate our 20-year uh, anniversary this year, which is really exciting. And we've been in Stockholm for five years. So it's kind of a double anniversary, five-year anniversary here in Stockholm and 20 in, in, um, as a company. Um, so we have eight different offices in five different uh, countries. Helsinki is our um, headquarters. And then we have um, Stuttgart in Germany being our latest addition. So this is our office. And uh, this is obviously where we would have hoped to have you all today. Um, hopefully we can do this again in the future when everything is, um, you know, back to the new normal. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Yuhamati, or Yuhis, as he uh, calls himself. Um, welcome. Awesome. Thank you, Yasmina. Uh, like I was said, like she said, I'm Yuhis. Super happy to be here uh, talking to you today. And I really also wish that I could have been there in Stockholm with you originally. I was planning to be there in April doing this talk in person. And I hope that once the situation gets better, we can maybe go for a fika together when I, I come visit Stockholm. But today I wanted to talk about documentation. It's something that throughout my career I've noticed more and more all the time. It's something that we as software developers are not always that good at. And it's one of those things where, even if we are good at it, it gets kind of deprioritized. It's among things like testing, where it happens if there's time. And today I wanted to talk about documentation from a perspective, and kind of hoping to give you really practical things that you can do still this week when you get back to work. So you don't have to re-envision everything and change everything you do, but you can make small adjustments and small improvements to get better at the documentation that, that you do in your project. Okay, let's see if I can get the technology to work. So, I've decided to take this point of view of contemporary documentation. And it's, it's not something that's kind of well-defined, because I just kind of came up with the term when I was, was thinking about documentation. So let's start by some definitions. First of all, if we look at the dictionary, we can see that contemporary can mean two different things. And it's something that kind of those two definitions cover almost everything. It covers the past and the present. And today 
inside the documentation. As the presentation goes on, you will understand a little bit better what that means. So a little bit of background on me. I'm Kanyuis from Helsinki. So I work at Futuris at the other side of, of the sea here in Helsinki. And I work as a developer advocate, which means that during this these special times, uh, it's been quite a different time. I normally host a lot of meetups. I go to a lot of conferences, meetups, meet a lot of developers. So these past eight months have been quite an interesting approach of, of new kind of thinking into what it could mean. And as a hobby, I also run a developer community, pretty much like the Stockholm JS. It's called Turkulov's Frontend. We've been in operation for almost five years now. We run monthly meetups, just like you do here. And the reason why I really want to talk about this, and the reason I think that you should listen to me when I talk about this, is that I have a background of being a developer, both as an independent contractor, as a software consultant at Futurist, and also in fast-growing startups in Silicon Valley and here in the Nordics. And throughout all of those, I've noticed one thing that's common, and that is that teams change. New people come in, old people leave. And when I've been doing this talk in person, I've asked people to raise their hand if they are working in a project and they've been on that project for two years or more and there hasn't been any new people coming or any old people leaving. And quite often I only get maybe one or two hands. Because software as an industry is also something that changes all the time. The average tenure of a career in a single company is about two years, which means that everything that we don't document in some form is gonna be lost it's going to be the silent knowledge that we lose when old people leave and when new people join. Because they don't know about those things, they might not know that they should be asking about them. And the idea with this contemporary documentation is that we're able to capture those things in the history as they happen. So that when we need to look back, we can figure out why certain things were done. And since I'm assuming that the audience is mostly for developers, I'm not going to do a documentation 101. But I do want to talk about a couple of things. First one is that a good documentation doesn't just document what and how. Some people argue that those shouldn't be documented at all. I don't agree with that. But I think that if we only document the kind of technical things, what does it do, how does it do that, we lose the most important thing and the most difficult thing to figure out afterwards. And that's why. Why was something done this way? Why did they use this library? Why is this line of code here? And there's a good reason for that. And the idea is that most of the documentation we want to keep up to date. Documentation should be a living organism that changes as the software evolves. Nobody wants to see code comments, API docs, or like readmes where the information is not up to date. That's not something that's very valuable to us because then we run into problems of it doesn't, the documentation doesn't match the code. But there are certain things that if we always just keep updating and updating, we lose some of that history. And I think many of us have probably been in a situation where we're kind of thinking about why did they do this? 
messages decreases over time. So I'm not telling you that you need to make perfect commit messages all the time. Nobody can do that. But if you try to focus a little bit on making the commit messages better, that's going to go a long way. And when I think about what to write in the commit message, early in my career, I would just do one-liners. I would use the git commit dash m and provide a really small concise thing. Fix this issue or added that feature type of thing. But the more I've worked in projects, I've realized that the real question I need to ask is, what would I like to know two years from now? Coming back to this code, whether it's me or somebody else. And because we know so much about the code, we've been diving deep into it at the moment of creation. It's sometimes difficult to come up with those things because they're obvious to us. So I like to rephrase it in a way that what would you ask from a colleague who wrote this code two years ago? What are the things that are obvious to you now? What kind of process did you go through? Did you learn something new? Did you figure out something? Or if you made some decisions, what were those decisions? And why did you make them? Capturing the why, like I mentioned earlier, is one of the most difficult things to, to figure out afterwards. Because even if that colleague is there, two years from now, they won't remember what they were thinking. Here's one example. This is from a, a UK government project that showcases an example of a really big commit message. And the thing with commit messages is that storing text is cheap. It compresses nicely. So you can write a lot of it in the commit message. The headline should be a really concise and compact and to the point so that somebody just reading the list of commits can see where it probably happened. But then the body of the commit, you can talk about what did you discover? What was there? What did you learn? Why did you make those decisions? Sometimes there's nothing to write. So you don't have to write this kind of an essay every time probably shouldn't. But when you have the time that you figured something out or you made a decision that feels obvious now but might not in a couple of years, write it down in the commit message. Because in two years, you're not going to be there. And even if you are, you won't remember what you were thinking. There's a lot of great tools that can help you write better commit messages Commit Dyson is one of them. I can share on, on Twitter these slides and a couple of extra links also to some really good tools that you can take into your team to make sure that everybody writes good commit messages. But since I promised earlier that you don't need to install any new tools, you don't need to introduce anything new, you can just continue with what you have. You don't need to go back in history. Just from this moment on, tomorrow you make a commit. Think about that commit a little bit extra. And think about what are the things that would be forgotten. The next aspect is the code review. I personally think that code review is, is essential for any team that has more than one person working on it. How to do code review, it really differs between teams, it differs between people. I think probably, at least on the projects that I've been working, one of the most common ones is, is to make a pull request on GitHub or GitLab. Then 
else might be involved in writing this down. So, one of the good things that I always like to capture is the origin of the bug or the feature request. What is the reason why this change is going to be made? Because quite often, as time goes on, we need to make changes that contradict something that was done previously. And if you made a change because there was this one special case for one special client that needed this little change, down the line, if you don't write that down, you're going to be afraid to change it. But if you write it down, you can go back to business and you can ask, is this still valid? And if it's, it's still valid, then you can bring up the discussion, these are contradicting changes. What do you want us to do? And then especially for bugs, steps for reproducing, they're not only helpful at the time of fixing the bug, but they can also be helpful in the future to see that whether the same bug happened again or whether like, this was something that that is similar enough that we can learn from it. Or maybe you see that in the future that the, the code was changed actually incorrectly and it didn't fix the bug, even though you thought at the moment that it did. And having a definition of done helps put things into a box where you can say, this was the, the life cycle of this issue, this feature, and then it was done. And I will show next what this means in the, the context of the workflow and how this can help you find the right places in your Jira or GitHub issues or whatever you use. And the crucial thing with this one, oh yeah, one more thing. Also in this one, ask a lot of clarifying questions. This is your moment when you can talk with the business needs, with the users that are reporting those things. And it's good to, to capture those at that moment when people are still thinking about them and they're fresh in their minds, rather than trying to figure them out two years later. And the crucial thing is to write them down. In two years, you won't be there and you won't remember the discussions that were made. So it's really crucial to write these things down, not at the end of the week, not at the end of the project, but when they happen. Write them down right away. Best is if you can have the discussion on that platform so all of the discussion gets tracked. But even if you do it in person, write it down. I'm going to show a real quick example of kind of how I work with this when I find something that's a little bit weird, a little bit odd, and I want to figure out what's been done. So let's have this imaginary project and I run into this some function that doesn't look like the math that I was taught at school. It's a little bit weird. There's a lot of different constants, some multiplication and subtraction and all that good stuff. And there is a comment that says a little bit about that. But I really want to get back in the history to see what kind of things were made. So the first thing I can do is I can use git blame these are tools that are also these days built in to most of the editors. If you use something like VS Code, some IDEs, you can get these directly from that. But to be a little bit kind of tool agnostic, I'm using the command line tool and I can find that line. And at the beginning of that line, I can find the commit hash. That tells me where did this commit come in? Sometimes you need to go a little bit like multiple layers back in the history because there might be some styling changes. Things might have been renamed. So it might not always be the latest thing. Then I go in this case in GitHub. I put that in the search box and it gives me the commit for this commit hash. And this is not a particularly good example 
questions to review. Some additional changes. And then I can also mark on the pull request that this fixes a particular issue. And these tools are quite uh, like interconnected these days. You can use them really nice and easy. This one uses GitHub issues. So I can just say fixes number two. And when I click that, I get keen to the issue. And now I can read the discussion about the origin, the business driver. Why was this needed in the first place? What was the definition of done? And this way, starting from the code, this one line that I'm, I'm hesitant to change because it doesn't look what I expect it to look. And I can go back and I can find all that information that didn't get updated as the documentation was. It didn't get updated in two years. The history is still there. So let's recap. Commit messages, code reviews, stories, task issues. They are a really good way to capture the moment in history into something that doesn't change, doesn't get updated, and doesn't get removed. Think about what would you like to know in two years. Try to get over the things that are obvious and things that you know because you spent the last week on that piece of code. Try to record all of those things. And lastly, maybe most importantly, write it down. Because in two years, you're not going to be there. And even if you are, you won't remember what you were thinking. I'm Lewis. I'm super happy that I got the opportunity to come here and, and talk with you. You can find me on Twitter at Amati. I also write a personal blog at Amati.org. I post weekly about technology, sometimes about community. I also run the developer newsletter at Futurist called Dev Breakfast. You can find it at hello.futurist.com slash dev dash breakfast. Every month, one of my colleagues from all around the Europe collects a, a collection of articles, interesting things in the web to share to software developers like you. I think now we can take a look if there's any questions. I will be looking every now and then to my, my left because that's where my laptop is. And we also have Johnny joining us for the, the Q&A. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that for that presentation. I think it was uh, super interesting. And I, I really like the, um, I mean, the, the kind of approach to, uh, to documentation. I think that was uh, yeah, super interesting. And I, I, I recognize so many of the, of the things uh, you mentioned. Uh, and um, yeah, I want we. I don't see any questions at the moment, so I'm wondering if does anyone have anything they wonders or anything like that. And also, if you don't come up questions now, feel free to tweet at them or send me an email, and I will I will definitely get back to those. And since there are no questions, I I do want to emphasize that making small improvements little by little is something that's going to make a big difference in the end. I think quite often when we read some blog posts or watch conference talks, there's often these kind of big ideas of changing everything and starting from the scratch. And that's definitely something that kind of, it can be a little bit too much to get started with. But now I see that we have some good questions coming up. Yeah. Uh, I can, uh, yeah, I can probably read them. Yeah, or you, <laughs> uh, I can take the, the first one. Is it a, a best, uh, is, is time best spent documenting code or writing commits? Is there a trade off between them? It depends a bit on what you mean by documenting code. Oh. I think it doesn't matter that much where the documentation lives. Some documentation is great to be in the code commit, uh, code comments. That's also something that really heated. I'm not gonna go too deep into that. Some people really love code comments, some absolutely hate them. 
Oh, I'm not with you. I think it's a time well spent. Mm. Nice. Uh, uh, then we have uh, one more question here. When uh, documenting things in uh, Jira uh, are when documenting things in Jira boards are that are team specific and not shared between teams, how do we handle this? I have to say I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Kati. In my experience, the projects that I've worked in, you usually have a code base and a Jira board related to that. Especially when it comes to kind of finding out what was done, going from the code into the Jira board. If the thing is about documenting things, that the discussions might happen with a team that, that doesn't have access to it. You can just write those discussions down. I probably didn't answer your question, I'm sorry. We can, we can maybe have a, a kind of a continuation discussion about that at the end as well. Uh, yeah, and uh, so we ha yeah, we have a follow up here. I can follow up. Uh, we have a development team of 50 people split up in multi multiples, and uh, we don't necessarily share the information across teams. Yeah, I think that if there is information that, that influences your team, your team should know about that. And it sounds like that, if that's the case, if the, the teams are too siloed and too kind of separated from each other, even if there's some overlap in the business domain or things like that, I would do a retrospective between those teams and kind of drill deep into what is the information that's missing, what kind of problems is that causing, and how you can, as multiple teams, improve the situation of of sharing the, the information but it's it's more of an it's, it's not an easy challenge let me say that organizational things are, are never easy so figuring out maybe there's a way to to have kind of like a an extra added shared space where these teams can can contribute with each other awesome I think that was the, the questions. If some come up, we can also then, then take a look at them at the end. But I think now is a good time to, to continue with the meetup. Thanks for having me. I hope you all have a, a great week. And I hope that when the, when the situation allows, I'll be able to come and visit the meetup in person as well. Yeah, we look forward to have you in uh, Stockholm. And thank you so much for your presentation. I think this was really, really interesting. And you really, you, you talked about some some really important things for all developers. I mean, I just like a comment from me is that you mentioned uh, two years uh, a lot of times. And I'm like, I don't remember for like one day, like in a week or something. So um, I, I usually see when, when, with the things that I've written myself why why did this happen and why have someone do done this and i'm like oh it's me uh, so <laughs> i think this was a really 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 interesting talk and what we will do now is that we will have uh, just a five minute uh, break um before jens is gonna have his presentation so you can take this break for i don't know if someone needs to go to the, bath the bathroom or grab a grab a drink or something and uh, during this break we will just um uh, screens and our mics. So, uh, just so you know, it will be exactly five minutes and then we are coming back. So, yeah, see you in five minutes. Uh, that means that we will be back uh, 1856. So, see you around in five minutes.
right, then we are back. Uh, Jens, are you here as well? Or can you hear me? Yes, I am. <clears throat> All right, nice. And I hope that everyone is uh, everyone who's watching is still here. Um, what uh, if we look at the attendee list? It seems like it was just two people disappearing during the break. I think that's a that's a good review. <laughs> so um, I'll say with no further speaker, uh, Jens, take it away. So thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, Matti, thank you for the awesome uh, presentation. Just a few hours ago, I was uh, talking to colleagues about a project that I left two years ago, helping them out with some things. And really, uh, better commit messages would have helped, I think, uh, from my end. So uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, WebAssembly. And uh, I'm going to focus first on how it is, what it is, and also a bit on how you can get started. And also, I'm going to touch a bit upon like why uh, people are talking about this as uh, uh, revolutionary, uh, as far as the web is concerned. Um, my name is uh, Jens Östlund. And I work as a software developer and tech lead at Futurist in Stockholm. Uh, I've been working at Futurist for three and a half years. And prior to that, I worked um, in web development and also natural language processing. Uh, so when I'm not coding, I'm uh, very much into languages, both, uh, of course, programming languages, but also uh, natural languages. And I'm uh, uh, quite a music nerd as well. Yes. So first of all, uh, what is WebAssembly? Um, if you look at the uh, uh, definition on the web page, uh, they say that it's a binary instruction format and that it is a portable compilation target uh, for programming languages. So enabling deployment on the web for client and server applications. And uh, interestingly, uh, the W3C, the uh, main international standards organization for the World Wide Web, has announced WebAssembly to be the fourth language of the web. And uh, um, it's already on. Uh, like version 1.0, which is uh, deemed a minimum viable product version of WebAssembly. And it's supported by 93% of uh, uh, browsers, according to Can I Use. Um, so why uh, is WebAssembly important? And why do they spend time doing this? Um, it's mainly to enable things that were before kind of out of um, reach for plain JavaScript, especially CPU intensive things. So image, video, audio processing, games, VR, augmented reality, um, language interpreters and virtual machines, um, and so on. These things can, of course, be implemented in JavaScript, but um, usually the um, performance will not be on par with um, native uh, applications. So in order to kind of give you a sense of this, I've created a small demo. So I've created a, a web camera pixelator. What it does is that it captures a frame from uh, uh, your camera. It splits the frame up into 16 by 16 pixel squares. It sets the color of each square to the average color of all pixels within it, and then updates the frame uh, with the pixelated value to give uh, a feeling of a pixelated image. Uh, I've implemented this in both JavaScript and WebAssembly. 
And uh, in both implementations, I've tried to be idiomatic and not strive for optimizations. And uh, the main reason for this is to give like an idea of uh, the performance difference of the two uh, languages. So on your left, hopefully you'll see uh, a smooth uh, version of the pixelation uh, run in WebAssembly. And uh, on the right, you'll see uh, JavaScript. And there's an, uh, there should be a noticeable lag in the JavaScript version. Uh, you can try this out yourself uh, following the links below. Um, so why is the uh, WebAssembly uh, version so much smoother? Um, because JavaScript is fast. JavaScript can run at near uh, native speeds. So it's not necessarily uh, speed that is um, speed alone um, that is a factor here, but the way in which the browser handles JavaScript. So in, if we look at how the browser handles JavaScript, it first needs to download uh, the script file it then has to parse it and create bytecode, which is an intermediate representation, which it can then compile down to machine code, which is executed on your machine. And here, it, it kind of gives a so-called baseline machine code because it can't really know much about your code because JavaScript doesn't give you any types or any real type information, especially pertaining to numbers. It just has one number representation. And uh, so what they did, most browsers do this, they, add, they added a so-called uh, just-in-time compiler, which uh, as the code is running, is optimizing it. So it, it checks uh, what types are flowing through your program and updates the machine code based on those inferences. And this is what can make JavaScript execute extremely quickly or have really good performance. And uh, unfortunately, if the inferences turn out to be wrong, a function that once took an integer all of a sudden gets a float or a, um, an array or something else, then it has to do de-optimization. So then it uh, throws away all the optimizations it has done, moves back to the baseline machine code, and starts this process over. Um, and apart from this, you also have to uh, think about the garbage collector coming in and freeing memory that is no longer used. So all of these things, as you can imagine, it's very hard to get a stable, uh, pre um, to get stable performance that you can predict. So if you compare this to the WebAssembly uh, model, you have a module uh, in WASM, which is the binary format of WebAssembly, it is streamed to your browser and at the same time compiled. So your browser can start compiling the code as it's downloading it. Uh, and then um, it just executes it. So the, uh, um, it doesn't have to do the same kind of optimization steps and uh, so on that as JavaScript does. And it um, doesn't. There's no danger of falling back to a suboptimal implementation or uh, version of machine code as well. So, how does it work then? First of all, uh, WebAssembly is strictly typed, and it has only numeric types. So, two types of integers: 32-bit uh, and 64-bit, and two types of floats. So the purpose of the typing system is not for um, expressiveness um, on the part of the developer, 
but solely to help with um, uh, optimization during compilation. And the execution model is um, stack-based, which you can which is kind of similar to how a normal pocket calculator works. This means that um, it doesn't have a um, it doesn't have a uh, register, for instance. And uh, also, it is fully sandboxed and doesn't get any access to um, system calls or system memory without the host giving explicit permission to them. And we'll see how that happens. So we'll start with a basic example. Here we see an example of uh, the WebAssembly text format. Uh, what W A T, and um, it kind of looks similar to a Lisp, and uh, this kind of illustrates uh, also the stack-based um, nature of uh, nature of WebAssembly. So, if we look at the code, it starts declaring by declaring a module. Uh, each, every uh, WebAssembly file is a module. And then it declares a function. In this, call, in this case, a function called sub. And that function is exported to the host as the string sub. It takes two parameters, x and y. Both are integer 32 bits. And it returns a result of integer 32. The first, what first happens is that it gets the value of x and puts it on the stack. It then gets the value of y and puts it on the stack. And then it does subtraction of those and leaves the result on the stack. And then if you look on the right, we have, um, uh, we have uh, an example of how you use this in JavaScript. So what you f the first thing you do is that you instantiate your um, uh, module. So you see the instantiate streaming. That is what I talked about, that you, uh, it starts compilation as it, as it's, or um, parsing as it's downloading it. This returns an instance and a module. A module is the compiled version of uh, the um, uh, WebAssembly module that you can then pass on to um, uh, other worker threads. So you don't have to do the whole uh, parsing step again. And instance is what you actually can use. It, the instance contains um, the memory and also the um, exported functions and so on. And here we see um, on the last line how it's used. So you, uh, d uh, you <clears throat> access the exports uh, on the instance and you do sub. And here we see a, uh, another example of, and in this example, we sh I show you how you can do to do other things than just playing with numbers. So if we look on the left first, we see that the module uh, declares two imports, rand and log. And it exports a function called log random number. It first calls rand, which gives a result of i32, which is left on the stack, and then it uh, calls a function called log that uh, takes that as an argument. And if we look on the right, we see that uh, we begin with declaring functions for this. So get random integer returns a random integer. Print result writes that to uh, the page. And then during instantiation, we pass what is called a, an import object. And there we declare the namespace env, and then uh, the functions random log. And then you can just call it as we, as you saw in the earlier example. 
So this is how you uh, can interact with, or one of the ways you interact with the host environment. And uh, here is a, um, a bit more complicated example. So this is when you need to in, uh, like interoperate with non-numeric data. Because up until now, we haven't really passed any uh, data to and from WebAssembly that hasn't been numbers. But in this case, we're going to send a string. Uh, so we can't pass strings to WebAssembly because WebAssembly only takes numbers. So what we need to do is we need to import memory or we need to pass uh, the bytes of a string in memory to uh, WebAssembly and then uh, operate on that in order, to, um, uh, in order to update things. So here, the, I think the, more, uh, the most illustrative thing is to look at on the right, on the JavaScript. So what we begin with is to declare this string that we want to operate on. And then we um, uh, create an instance of WebAssembly memory on the host, so in JavaScript. Um, and then we populate that memory with the bytes of the string. And then we, when we instantiate the module, we pass that memory in. And then we call the function giving a pointer to, this, uh, to the place where the first byte of the string is, and then the length of it. And then uh, WebAssembly does its thing, and then we retrieve the string from memory. So as you can see by this, this is not really something that you would want to do by hand. Um, it kind of becomes masochistic pretty quickly. And um, the intention was never to write WebAssembly uh, by hand like this. Uh, but rather use it as a uh, compilation target from other languages. So a compilation target, that means that you, you write your logic and your application in one language, and then instead of compiling it down to machine code uh, that runs on your machine, you compile it down to WebAssembly. And there are two, the two most frequently seen approaches for this is uh, compiling C, C++ using mscript or Rust. So uh, the uh, uh, developers of WebAssembly has always been, their main focus has been on C and C++. But uh, what happened was that Rust uh, started to do more and more in this area. So they started to uh, create a lot of tooling to help you get started writing WebAssembly and also um, creating a lot of good documentation on how to get started. So uh, my impression now is that um, mostly people start doing WebAssembly with Rust. Uh, it's only people who, are com like, who have been working with C and C++ that uh, use mscript then. And um, yeah, so from now on, I'll show how to do like a small example here in um, how you can do things with Rust. So with Rust, you have something called WASM pack, which gives you uh, a really nice interface to the browser from Rust with uh, using WebAssembly. So here, if you look on the right on the code, we can see that we, we get the window object. From the window, we get the document, and then we get the body. We list, uh, we create a list element, and uh, we uh, create items of each, uh, each string in the vector, and then we just append it. So it's not much different from doing it in uh, JavaScript. And if you, if you remember the uh, slide before where uh, you saw how you had to work with what you had to do in order to work with um, 
uh, non-numeric da uh, data, you can see the amount of like the heavy lifting that this does for you. Uh, and while this is pretty amazing, um, I'm not really sure that you'd want right now to write your whole application in uh, Rust. JavaScript is still pretty good uh, for that purpose. Um, and you need to remember that every time uh, you transition between uh, JavaScript and WebAssembly, there is a cost of um, moving things to memory, reading from memory, updating memory, and passing it back. So um, this should most likely be used sparingly for now. So what other approaches do we have? Uh, Rust can be pretty intimidating because, of, because it has uh, um, a fairly d expressive and difficult typing system and also introduces a lot of concepts that um, you're not, you most likely aren't familiar with coming from JavaScript. It's a bit more low level. Uh, so in that case, if you just want to play around with it, um, there's assembly script, which strives to be like TypeScript, uh, like a TypeScript to WebAssembly uh, alternative. So on your left, on the left, you can see the um, uh, a piece of source code, and it looks very much like TypeScript. Um, and the the interrupt seems to be really nice. Um, but the problem, there are a few caveats here. Uh, it's not really like TypeScript, so it, the semantics are different. So equality checks. Uh, do not work the same. And also there are no union types. So a lot of the patterns that you use in uh, TypeScript do not, uh, are not applicable here. And uh, there are no closures. And uh, this means that things like arrow functions that access variables outside of uh, its own scope, uh, you can't do that at all. So still, uh, it might look like TypeScript, but actually writing it feels very different. Um, but these things are, they're working hard on uh, uh, mitigating these differences and so on. And once uh, WebAssembly support for um, garbage collected languages lands, it's something that they're working on, but it's not there yet then I think solutions like this will be a lot uh, better. So I would recommend this for writing smaller modules. So if you just need to do numeric operations, I think it's a really viable alternative to uh, using Rust. So um, what happens now then? Uh, we've only looked at the browser so far, but WebAssembly actually um, reaches out uh, to the server as well. So already in Node, uh, you have a WebAssembly uh, interpreter that you can use readily. Um, so you can share code between uh, the browser and server. Um, and uh, there are people working with um, operating system interop with uh, a project called WASI, uh, WebAssembly System uh, Interop. Yeah, well, um, so you can do things like access the file system and things like that from WebAssembly. And uh, there's also uh, people working on different portable runtimes. So you can uh, run, uh, you can like incorporate um, WebAssembly in another code base, for instance, or you could run it on your server, or you can uh, run it on embedded devices, let's say. And it also already has a, um, uh, Wasmer already has a package manager, a WAPM, which is a replacement for NPM in their case. Uh, when I looked through it, it seems like most, ex most packages uh, right now are uh, toy examples, but I think uh, 
we might see interesting things there. So what happens in the future? Is this the holy grail of write once and run everywhere? Seeing that more and more languages will support or compilation to uh, WebAssembly. Uh, can you write something in the language that you're most um, well versed in and no one else has to ever rewrite that logic? They can just use that WebAssembly uh, binary in uh, whatever language that they're using. Um, and uh, some people speculate that this might be the end of Docker and containers. Uh, here, I'm not really sure. Uh, to what extent that is. But when you're using containers as plain binaries, uh, yes, perhaps. The uh, WebAssembly uh, code can uh, start up a lot faster than uh, containers can. And also, they don't have the same bloat with um, uh, a whole operating system and so on. And uh, also, can are people going to stop using JavaScript? Um, I don't think that is the case either. Um, as uh, We3C said, it's the fourth language of the web. So the use case for it is still just to uh, allow for performant things on the web. And uh, as you can see, it's still in its early stages uh, with um, uh, lack of proper type support and things like that. So uh, I think it's still going to be quite some time before we, uh, uh, like JavaScript if, uh, is, uh, until we see less of JavaScript on the web. Uh, I know that uh, the .NET team uh, are trying to move C Sharp onto the browser uh, using WebAssembly and so on. And I think more uh, other companies will follow suit. But still, I think JavaScript is here to stay. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and um, I hope this was interesting for you. WebAssembly is a really deep topic. And it was hard to uh, not get uh, too deep down the rabbit hole, but yes. Uh, on this slide, I have uh, some links and uh, links to source code and so on. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, please uh, put them in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was, uh, that was uh, really interesting. Thank you. And uh, well, as... as uh, as before, we don't have any questions right now, or we have one question, but uh, and that was uh, if you, in your first sub.wat, and then you had a file called sub.wasm, yeah. and it was that the same thing, or a typo, or? Yeah, so this is, uh, this, uh, is actually a really good question. Uh, so the... Um... Uh, the textual representation and the um, uh, binary representation are not like you don't compile really the uh, textual representation to uh, the binary. It's more of a just a plain translation because they're very close. So when you're looking in, when you're using WebAssembly modules in your browser, and if you click in your developer tools on that binary it will show you uh, the textual representation. So that's, uh, that is how similar they are. And, uh, but when you serve WebAssembly, uh, you need to do it in the binary format. So uh, then there's a, there are tools for, uh, for translating the textual format to uh, the um, binary format. Yeah, right. I hope nice. that. Uh, so yeah, no, it was I not that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good to know. The audience. Yeah, we have one here. Uh, I might have missed it, but in what way was WebAssembly 
was the WebAssembly version of the pixel camera thing uh, written? Assembly script? It was written in Rust. Um, so I started with um, uh, just plain Rust and WASM pack uh, to write that. And then I tried to re-implement it in assembly script, but failed due to uh, uh, not really, uh, well, the closure thing, how closures worked, and I, I didn't have time to fix. Uh, and uh, the source code for it contains, uh, the, uh, if you go to the source code later, uh, there are several branches there with different implementations in uh, plain JavaScript and in uh, and two different Rust implementations, I think. Um, hmm. Sounds good. And, and uh, maybe will will you share the presentation for for both you and you Amate? Will you share the presentations in the comments on on um, the Meetup page, maybe? Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I will. That would be awesome. Mm. Some uh, questions here, like what was your first WebAssembly project and was it hard hard to learn? Yeah, so my first WebAssembly project that I wrote was actually the Pixelator. That was the, uh, um, and uh, it was a bit hard, but I found this really good book. And unfortunately, I forgot to put it on uh, the interesting links page, but I'll, I'll put it in the comments. But there's one called WebAssembly and Rust, a book that was released late last year. That is, uh, I, I can't uh, like uh, overstate how amazing that book was for getting started. And um, so on. I'll, I'll post that. Um, yes, that because is, usually like you only see really simple examples. And uh, I wanted to do something a little bit more. Try. Yeah, I, I kind of recognize that when uh, when I've been looking around uh, WebAssembly as well. It's it's usually like a really simple example, like yeah, this is how you get started, and I'm like, yeah, so how am I supposed to use this for anything useful? <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. But then I also like I've seen you know, a bunch of other examples, but like the code the code examples are usually pretty, uh, yeah, basic. Um, yeah. So that sounds. Great. And now we have an, another question, um, and that is, when should one think about implementing things? Uh, like, like how, like how yeah. heavy does it have to be, or such? Yeah. In so, I think that there are a lot of um, considerations to take in. So currently, there's no good way. Of, let's say that you're working in a JavaScript code base. There is no good way of writing things in JavaScript and like taking that into WebAssembly. So you will have to introduce another language and another like <clears throat> build like build step and everything like that into your project. So uh, you really need to like have the whole team on board. I think is important because if you do something non-trivial, then you might have to move to Rust. And uh, learning Rust, like the documentation and the like, the learning material for Rust is uh, like bar none. Like they have s so amazing documentation for uh, for getting started and for like their introductory material is great. But still, it's a huge investment uh, to. Uh, get fluent in it. So um, that is definitely a consideration when you look at like, okay, should we put WebAssembly in here? Uh, if you look at like what you might need it for, if there's something in your application where stability is very important, and when I talk about stability, I mean like performance. So let's say that you, you're uh, you're changing video on the fly or you're uh, doing things like that, then um, uh, then I think WebAssembly is a really viable option because um, using JavaScript, you might get uh, fluctuations. 
also i think some in in some aspects if you have to serve things in a place where you have flaky internet connection and people are using uh, subpar like not not really like the latest uh, hardware uh, moving some of the like operations you might leave to the server to the device using WebAssembly, uh, if possible, that might actually prove to be a better uh, user experience than moving to the server back and forth. So we might see a move from the server to the client for certain operations, um, I think, with this. Um, I don't know if that really answered uh, Daniel's question. Uh, I hope it did. I think it did. Uh, yeah, I think that that was the last question, and uh, I will see if we can get uh, Yasmina, uh, I would say, up here <laughs> or online here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so I just want to thank you uh, once again, Jens, for that a really really interesting presentation. And uh, yeah, uh, that was that was nice. And uh, we look forward for afterwards. Seems like mm -hmm. there's a lot of things to to read up on. Oh, now everyone is, uh, is up there. <laughs> Can everyone see me, hear me? Yeah. No? Yes. Yes? Uh, <laughs> OK. <laughs> I can't see my but, um, Thank you, thank you, Juhis, uh, and thank you, uh, Yoni. This was um, a really good night, um, and I hope that everyone, um, everyone at home was able to, you know, have a drink, have a bite, and uh, learn something fun and interesting. Yeah, <laughs> me, me too. And uh, yeah, we are, as from Stockholm JS side of things, we're super happy that you wanted to host this this meetup. And uh, and yeah. Thank uh, you. I, yeah, sorry for the for the lag there. I think uh, <laughs> this tool is is giving us some trouble uh, tonight. But um, yeah, thank you again. And um, I guess we'll we'll wrap it up here, unless there's anything else from from anyone in the audience. But I don't think so. No, it seems uh, seems like uh, people have gotten their. Uh, questions answered and uh, so so I think it's just time to say goodbye for this time and I mean Stockholm JS will be back at uh, some point again uh, we're really happy to to do this uh, this online meetup so if there are any other people out there who is working at a company that want to host a meetup you're very welcome to contact us and uh, yeah once again th thanks a lot futurist for for hosting this meetup it was really nice and thanks thank you so much for both of the, the talks uh it was really interesting and uh yeah hope to see you in the real world <laughs> so, soon as well <laughs> yeah hopefully we can have a face-to-face -face one uh, one soon um but yeah thanks again have yeah. a good night everyone <laughs> yeah, thank bye. you bye see ya bye